Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, you're tuning in for uh, Sixth and I's Tikkun Leil Shavuot, our all-night study in honor of the holiday of Shavuot, and also for Dawn, which is a partnership with Reboot and the Gen Network. Um, tonight, we're going to be bringing you conversations all night long, starting now until about 6.30 or 7 in the morning, all about the essence of Torah, of sacred learning, and what it means to be together in this moment. Our first session tonight is sort of builds on the idea of the very, very first Shavuot gathering, which was at the foot of Mount Sinai, when the Israelites first received the Torah. Um, and here to be in discussion with me, I'm just so deeply grateful, uh, is Priya Parker, who I, I think is sort of the preeminent scholar of gathering in America right now. And we're just so grateful that she's, uh, that she's uh, gonna be in conversation, we're gonna get to be in conversation tonight to talk about in this crazy and terrible moment that has sparks of loveliness, how are we gathering differently? I I'm, I'm sure many of you know who Priya is. God willing, most of you have read her extraordinary book, The Art of Gathering. If you haven't read it, please, please, please pick it up and do so. It's good. It'll be good for you, your community, and for our country. Um, she's also the executive producer and host of the New York Times podcast, Together Apart. Um, she spent 15 years helping leaders and communities have complicated conversations about community and identity and vision at moments of transition. Um, this is definitely a moment of transition. Um, and she's trained in the field of conflict resolution, which I definitely want to get back to. The idea that conflict resolution is not just something um, that we talk about in terms of Israelis and Arabs, or you know, you said in your bio it says you've done work in Southern Africa and India, but it's also something that we need to talk about in the dinner parties that we throw, in the ways that we interact with each other. It's skills that we all desperately need. Um, She's a founding member of the Sustained Dialogue Campus Network, a member of the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on, Value, Council on Values Council, and the New Models of Leadership, and a senior expert at Mobius Executive Leadership. Wow. Um, she studied organizational design at MIT, public policy at Harvard Kennedy School, and political and social thought at the University of Virginia. Um, welcome, welcome, and I can't say enough. Thank you so much, Priya, for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Great. Well, I, I feel like your voice has been in my head the last uh, few <laughs> months, at least, because I've been listening. That's the danger of a podcast. Exactly. <laughs> you have a bug in your ear. <laughs> I do. I feel like we're best friends already. I just, you know, because I've been in conversation with you so much, but I'm, look, I'm really excited to do it uh, sort of in person, but of course not in person. That's how I want to begin. Like I just, this, this is such a, a bittersweet moment, right? Like on the one hand, who knows if we, our schedules would have been able to match up to do this in person. On the other hand, like, ah, here we are. Um, you know, so I guess one of the podcasts, I think either you or someone you interviewed were talking about, you know, we, we were so oriented towards when something bad happens, looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. And here we're like, we're still in the middle of the tunnel. And I guess like in terms of the work that you do, gathering people together, what is some of what you're seeing about the way that humans are being for better or for worse as we're stuck here in this tunnel? The, the phrase light at the middle of the tunnel actually came from the older sister in that pairing that I was talking to. Um, it, this was early March and I got a phone call, uh, I guess it started with an email from an older sister who wanted to um, do something for her younger sister. They're 12 years apart and she saw her baby sister, uh, you know, high school graduation being canceled, prom being canceled, um, end of year potlucks, you know, fill in the blank being canceled. And she was talking to her sister and her sister said, you know, the thing that I'm most upset about is my birthday, you know, being canceled and particularly my birthday party. And the idea of this podcast is, um, we're following people all over the country whose gatherings have been upended by the coronavirus and are trying to figure out how do you still be together meaningfully apart. And this is a, um, this is a story of a young woman who uh, felt like she, like so many of us, is sort of stuck. Like she's, she, was, she had a tough time in high school and she just kind of felt like she was getting to the light at the end of the tunnel literally, right? She's yeah. leaving this godforsaken place and, and going to Vermont, in her case, for college. And um, long story short, the con I got on the phone with the two sisters and started to just really listen. And the questions that I ask with any type of gathering, whether it's a town hall, whether it's a board meeting, or whether, in this case, a birthday party is, what is your need right now? 
And how do you make this gathering specific and unique to that person? And through conversation, she, the, the younger sister kept on saying how much she loved to read. And she's also, she identifies as queer and she recently came out and had basically been exploring different ways of coming into herself. And this last bastion was that she was a closet reader. <laughs> and um, we started to play with different forms of a gathering. And she thought, you know, having a Zoom gathering and a birthday party sounded completely depressing. And I said, just pause. If, you're, if it's only performative, right? Everybody comes in and you wear pointy hats and you blow out a candle and it's all fuzzy and grainy and you just realize that you're not together, it is kind of depressing. But what if you did something, what if you gathered in a way that was unique to this moment that um, had some amount of heat in it? And we borrowed an idea that college campuses do and German reading theaters, German reading groups do, which is read a novel together aloud for the duration of the entire book. And in this case, for that woman, this was a provocative, scary idea <laughs> to do in front of her, to reframe what it looks like to party and to have a good time in front of her peers, not behind a wall. Yeah. And it was her sister who ended up calling the party light at the middle of the tunnel because the conversation that we got into was that it's, it's, it's a false notion that we are not still growing, even though we are inside of our homes right? It's a false notion that our relationships are stagnant, right? They are also still growing in new ways. It is a false notion that we, that we ourselves, our spirits and our minds and our bodies are, are paused. And so the conversation began to say, given these new constraints, how might you actually, is it possible to have light at the middle of the tunnel that we generate ourselves? I, 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 um, I think that image is so resonant and in the little like the little like gems of Torah with a lowercase t that I'm going to take from this COVID time is going to be that, you know, I think in America, we're so trained always to like, look on the bright side. Everything is, is great. Everything. And even in, even in this moment of coronavirus, people are saying, oh, I get to spend more time with my family. I get to, and sort of like putting aside all of the challenges and every once in a while, it's okay to just like sit in the pain. Right. And and to find a certain, and to find like a happy moment like that, like that, that sister did. So I have like a thousand questions I want to ask, but I'm going to start with this one and then I might leave around to the yeah, other And I'll just, I, I mean, just building on what you said, I think the part of the conversation that was so powerful to me was she was not denying the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really hard for people to get in touch with the, the actual pain. Like there's a feeling that like, I, I felt this from some of my, congregants there's a feeling that if you actually glimpsed the mm -hmm. pain it would just sort of like you'd be subsumed by it you know and you'd never be able to climb out of it um, um and i just you know judaism as a tradition for better or for worse is like one where you're like really supposed to go into the pain like you know the idea you talked about in your when you were talking about funerals like in the jewish imagination the funeral is very sad right mm -hmm. like this and the whole mourning period is sad and but I do think that in America, culturally, it feels a little different. So there's something about saying, this moment sucks, right? We're not going to try to sort of obscure that too much. And yet, even in sadness, there can be a little bit of joy. I think one of the moments, one of the elements that the virus is, is bringing up is because it is so collectively, massively, overwhelmingly devastating. Yeah. You, you you can't look away. And I think one of the, I almost think of us as like lambs, like on wobbly knees learning to walk yeah. in terms of institutions and organizations and communities trying to figure out what type of ritual do we even begin to create to mark all that has passed. And I think you, you know, the New York Times uh, yesterday, oh. That front page. The front page was this new form of, but also a very old form, right? It's not unlike the 9-11 museum. It's a, yeah. of a collective, not an individual, a collective yeah. obituary, right? Yeah. And if you unpack, you see a thousand names, right? There's, yeah. There are hundreds of decisions that went into how to actually create that front page. And 
part of a ritual to mark and to grieve, I think that in particularly in terms of modern ritual, is that the creation and the invention of the new ritual is actually part of the process, right? So in my imagination, the newsroom trying to figure out that front page, do we, how many names do we choose, right? It was a thousand names out of a hundred thousand, so it's 1%. Do we allow the people's families to decide what the five words are going to be? Do we edit them for beauty or do we let them stand alone, right? How do you basically create meaning collectively and who gets to decide? And bit by bit by bit, we are in some pockets beginning to meet the moment by finding ways within, like that's what the New York Times can do. That's what a newspaper can do. That doesn't mean that every ritual should look that way. Yeah. But how do we begin to face and to acknowledge what has happened in a way that brings the community it happened to along. Yeah. And of course, like there is no more iconic um, community gatherer of New York City than the New York Times. You know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about, because obviously I'm someone who stands quite firmly like in the Jewish community. And so we have this added opportunity to use the millennia old tradition, but in ways that are newly meaningful, you know, in the, in the contemporary time. And so, you know, I think that the idea of we don't want to, we don't want to abandon what, I mean, you know, most of us don't want to abandon what we've been doing because there's something just about the, the ancient, like the sort of taking your, your, you know, you're taking your place with like thousands of years of tradition of people who have gone through plagues and terrible things. But there's also like, I mean, this question, every time I saw it in your book, I could not have highlighted it more. It's like, what is your need right now? I feel that if every synagogue service in America began with the rabbi sitting down and saying, what is the community's need right now? What it would revolution. I mean, I'm sure it's true for churches as well. I just can't speak for them. You know, it's just like <laughs> this idea is what is our need right now? And how do we honor the memory of all those who have lost and a little bit about them to show that they were actually human beings? Absolutely. Um, and you know, I mean, you know, it's it's kind of funny. I'll I'll say this to you <laughs> is I in writing the book, I you know, I, it was published two years ago. Um, and I researched it for over five years. And at some point I I had to stop. I had to make sure that all of my characters weren't Jewish. <laughs> and that is because the, you know, I, I had certain, so, so the book for those of you who haven't, you know, had a chance to look at it, it, I, I, as part of, I basically am curious, why do some gatherings take off and are transformative and memorable and others kind of just, you know, you forget about. And I'm a facilitator, and so it's through my lens. The book is written through my lens, but I interviewed over 100 gatherers in all types of contexts to ask them this question. And some of them were people that I've, I've heard of or gatherings I've been to. Some of them were stories I read in the newspaper, all the different ways you research. And at some point in the middle of this, you know, the 100 interviews, I started realizing that basically Jews know how to gather. <laughs> And, and there's, and that this community, which is like every community, many, many, many communities, some of the most innovative, relevant, need-based, powerful, collective gatherings are happening in and among Jewish life. And that's not an accident. Yeah. I agree. Is that weird to say? Like, I <laughs> no. know. And it's a collective culture, right? And it's a collective right. culture that has a, a deep you know, embedded practice of a, a collect of collective assumption as other, you know, as other communities have. I, I was recently speaking with somebody who is not Jewish and, um, but really loved the book. And he said, I under I realized that you were speaking my language, but I also, I, 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 I realized that many weeks later that it's because I'm Mormon and I grew up in the Mormon church as the equivalent of an altar boy. And to me, it's nothing to get up in front of an entire community and have a number of different norms and speak in a certain way and have this intertwining and interstitching. I think faith-based communities tend to be more collective. I mean, not in different ways. Like the Quakers also I derived a lot of inspiration from, but the opportunity is to apply the wisdom of the old ways yeah. to the new needs. Yeah, and I think like, you know, we can, we can get off like sort of the gifts of the Jews in a second, although I'm happy to talk <laughs> for an hour, but like, I do think, 
I come from the denomination called Reconstructionism. It's a tiny little denomination, but like, I do think that one of the things that all of Jews, this like sort of, this is a foundational reconstruction idea, reconstructionist idea, but really it's a foundational Jewish idea, is that like, we've had to live in so many different places, mm -hmm. in so many different societies over the course of millennia. And we've had to reinvent ourselves, sometimes quite radically, like after the destruction of our temple 2000 years ago, right after we had left slavery and you know had to stand it. My, there have been a number of times with the creation of the state of Israel, we've had to figure out how to sort of like be in a whole new way for better and for more complicated. And, and like, and so we have taken, you know, so much and learned so much from so many different societies that I just, there is a way that like Judaism is, there is an essence that is inherently Jewish, but there is an essence that is also from other places and other times. And um, when you just think about like how many, like the, the Jewish yoga class that we're going to have at like two fifteen in the morning, you know, on the Shavuot holiday, it's like, that Jewish yoga, I can, I, that is not something the Jews were doing a hundred years ago, right? But like, <laughs> we are part of this society where like yoga as a spiritual practice can sort of mess with Judaism and sort of, we can bring some of the best of the collectivity, I think. And some, some of the more complicated, but mm -hmm. some of the I mean, you know, I think so much um, invention comes from mixing and, yeah. it, you know, it's a convenient story for me to say because I come from mixing, right? I, I'm half Indian, half white American. My yeah. parents divorced when I was nine and they both remarried radically different people. And then I bounced between these two homes every two weeks. And yeah. one was this sort of Indian, British, Buddhist, agnostic, <laughs> you know, landmark for me household, Democrat, liberal, and the other, as you know, is a, is a evangelical Christian conservative, Republican, you know, climate skeptic, white American family. And, you know, I joke, my name is Priya Parker. Right. <laughs> and I think so much of what I, what has served me as a facilitator is that I know that the way that we live is made up. Yeah. And we make it up. And I know that because I had two parallel, completely radically opposing worlds every two weeks. Yeah. And I think part of what's interesting to me when you talk about even just the Jewish experience or the diasporic experience is that when, when two different elements even meet or confront each other, let alone begin to mix, you begin to realize that there are many ways to be. Yeah. I mean, think about Mani Shana Halayla Hazeh. Why is this night different than all other nights? Which is like one of the questions that you ask in the, you know, throughout your book. Like, where did we get the idea of the Seder from? It was from symposiums, right? Like the Greek symposiums. And we were like, oh, we love how they sit around and talk about ideas with just enough wine to like get the ideas flowing, <laughs> but not so much that they would get drunk. So we're going to take that. We're going to make it Jewish and historic and four glasses of wine. And so that even just that, it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, we, the collecting is in our kishkas is the Yiddish, but like the sort of learning and sort of how to do it better. And in this moment is something that like, and especially in the more liberal branches of Judaism, but really to a certain extent throughout is, you know, the sort of porousness is, is also, I think it's a benefit. Um, so anyway, enough about the Jews for this moment, <laughs> at, this moment at least. Um, oh. All right, I'm going to go back to the Jews because I just want to talk for a little bit about there's this, there's this phrase that you have that like has kept me up at night in ways because I liked it, but I also got nervous about how much I liked it. And the phrase is generous authority, right? Like here we are in America, I, you know, this is a place where like ev freedom, freedom everywhere. And you sort of like have this idea that actually, now I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm going to say it and then I'm going to say something else, but we can go back if I said it wrong. You have this idea that one way to actually bring freedom is with a little bit of what you call generous authority. And it's interesting because one of the texts that we often study around this time period of Shavuot is one that comes from like our, our Mishnah a few thousand years ago, where um, it talks about the tablets being given to the Israelite people at Sinai and that engraven on this tablet is, you know, like the Ten Commandments, you've maybe seen, the ten, you know, one of the movies about, and there's like a play on words that the rabbis have where they say, it reads basically both engraved, but also freedom, because in the Hebrew, they're almost the same words. Wow. And the rabbis say that like, in order to have freedom, you need to have the engraved words of Torah. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, wait, there's like generous authority. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about like, 
is, you know, how does generous authority provide for more freedom? Where is it complicated? How does it work in this moment? You can really answer any of the, you know, 10 questions I just asked. And sure. um, yeah, sort of how does it work for you and for the groups? So, so to place it into popular culture, I start out this idea of generous authority in railing against the idea of chill. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and there have been, you know, beautiful essays also railing against the idea of chill. And it's basically this idea that you, you want to leave your guests alone. You don't want to impose, I'm cool, you're cool, we're all cool, like, let's just hang out. Just don't worry about it. It's just like, we'll just, you know, bleh, whatever happens, happens. And somehow we've gotten distorted the idea of um, taking care of our guests with actually hanging them out to dry. And what I talk about when I say generous authority is that in many of our gatherings, not all of them, and I think per particularly in our social and our non-work gatherings, work have their own dynamics, we tend to under host. And we start under hosting not from a control perspective, we start, we start under hosting from not first asking what is the need here and are we gathering around it, right? right? So I define generous authority as the intentional use of power, the intent, the, 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 the host's intentional use of her power for the good of the group and its purpose. Okay. So when I, just to, to make it more practical, I think a, a good host connects its group to each other and to its purpose, protects its group from each other, right? The getting cornered at the, you know, networking event or a birthday party or a dinner party by somebody that you do not want to talk to for the entire night, a uh, volunteer at a training who continues to ask questions over and over again and monopolizes the entire conversation. Like it, to, to, to think when you are, when you think you are leaving people alone, you're not leaving them alone. You're leaving them to each other. <laughs> right. Right. And so Generous authority is this just the simple idea that in every gathering, and I define a gathering as anytime three or more people come together for a purpose, with the beginning, middle, and end. So it's not a community. Communities have gatherings. Gatherings can lead to community. But gatherings, I'm really interested in, in the anatomy of this event, of this happening. And in any gathering, anytime three people, for any time two or more people come together, there is a power dynamic. Right. If there's three or more people, what and 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 it's and you can't just say oh I don't like power I'm just not gonna I'm not one I'm not a power hungry it's not actually about that it's actually saying in any type of group you have to figure out how you're gonna make decisions at any moment and a good host makes a lot of decisions ahead of time based on what the purpose of the gathering is yeah I think uh, it, it just your acknowledging of the power in the room, I think is already something that for a lot of people would make them nervous right because they don't like to acknowledge power but like by not acknowledging power in the room, you're sort of defaulting in a way that's sort of Lord of the Flies-esque, right? And you're you're abdicating of, your role, right? Yeah. When Facebook says, we're a platform, <laughs> we don't have, we're not, we, right? They're abdicating their power so that, right. so that studies have actually shown it leads to authoritarianism, right? Like we, we, every gathering has power. And I define power in a gathering just simply as decision-making. And I'll give a simple example. Like think of think of a family. You're you're in a family of five, and figuring out where to go for dinner. You decide, okay, we're pre-corona. Wait, that's my corona. family. <laughs> if you can help me with this problem, this would be very good for my family. Well, I'm just gonna name the power dynamic. You can decide which which how your decisions get made. So say, okay, okay COVID is finally. We're we're gonna we're gonna go out, and we're gonna go to where are we gonna go tonight? And if you watch the way a conversation unfolds in any family. It's, uh, does the older sister say, I want to go to Mexican? And the younger sister says, we always go to Mexican. I want to go to Italian. And the mother says, actually, I really want to go to the American fusion restaurant. And at some level, at the, end of the t at the end of these five minutes or 10 minutes, a decision will have been made, right? That is power. Does it fall on, do they decide together? Does, does at the end of the day, it always goes to whatever the younger sister wants because everybody wants to please her so she doesn't you know, make a big fuss? Like whatever, however, every group, makes decisions even if you are not making a decision that's a decision and so from a gathering perspective if you haven't figured out what you're going to talk about or um at a i mean I'll, you know i was recently speaking with an indian community that is generationally vegetarian 
So they were having a family reunion and this is, um, it's a specific group with this last name in, in, from Western India, from Gujarat. And they're having a family reunion in California and their family reunions are like 30,000 people. Like oh it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's like more like, it's like a clan or a tribe. Yeah. And for every, for every year since it's happened, it's a vegetarian event. And this okay. year, the, you know, it's happening for 30 or more years, the founders realize they need to give it on to the next generation. And the next generation decides they want a meat table. Yeah. How do you make that decision? And is it just about power? No, it's about identity. Yeah. Can we still be Patels yeah. and, be and be meat eating? What does it mean? Right? Is this, can we, is this a line that we want to cross or not cross? All, all, all power in gatherings is where decisions land. And all I'm saying is be conscious of those decisions because they're going to happen whether or not you like it. So first of all, I am super concerned that you have a camera in my house because like, <laughs> we order out for Shabbat every Friday night. It's become our tradition and the, whatever. The fight you articulated, I feel like maybe we, I have a few more questions about how much. <laughs> Offline? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we just ask for now. Um, um, but there was something you just brought up with the family gathering that's really... I mean, I think one of the things, oh, so one of the things, you know, we think about this in Judaism a lot, especially in terms of the evolution of Judaism, right? Like at what point do you evolve so much that it's no longer recognizable as Judaism? And if one of the, one of the primary needs, I will say for me, maybe not for every Jew in the world, but like for the, one of the primary needs for the Jewish community is that it remains Judaism, right? Like it can't become a different thing. And so it's sort of like, how much can you evolve? Can you have women rabbis and it's still Judaism? Turns out that's fine. Fine. Can you have queer marriage and it's still Judaism? Turns out that's fine, right? Can you celebrate Shabbat on Tuesday night with a bacon cheese sandwich? I don't know. Like at what point does it, and I think that's like where the sort of danger is. And that's why the sort of, we talk about it as sort of like a values-based clarification. It's a little bit like your needs. Like, like what, is the, what is the primary value here or the primary two or three values? And how can you really, you know, laser focus in on those values, even though there's also going to be loss? Um, this to me is um, one of the dangers, I might even use the word poison right now in the United States, um, which is we've gotten stuck between our activities and our identities. Yeah. And, you know, I'll give a simple example. Um, in a non-Jewish context, I, uh, I was facilitating a gathering on this point, which is when, which is another way to think about it for me. And, and you know, I'm a conflict resolution facilitator, right? I, 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 gathering is line drawing, right? Gathering is making a choice. Who should be there? What is worthy of asking people for their time? How should we run the time? If somebody decides, I don't want to do this, do we go with the direction they want to go with or not? And, and a person in the audience shared an example. She said, I was in a, um, when I was in college, I was part of a group called um, the college, I think they're called the College Democrats. And, um, and it was, you know, everything was fine or fine. And one day somebody came in and said, and looked at the pro-life people and said, you can't be pro-life and a Democrat. And um, you need to join the college Republican yeah. group, right? And she shared this example, and the group fell apart yeah. because they couldn't decide what it meant to be a Democrat. Yeah. And so much, I mean, when I, you know, I'm a facilitator that works with communities at moments of transition. And you know what moments of transition are? They're actually opportunities to open up and ask the questions that you are asking tonight and many nights. Who are we? Yeah. When, what activities are part of our identity and what activities can we let go of? What are the lines, if everybody is invited, then nobody is invited. What are we willing to defend and what are we being myopic about? Yeah. And how do you figure that out? Oh, I mean, all right, I have to be totally honest with you because like, as you're saying this, like I, I find myself like starting to tear up because that's the hardest work possible. And so then the little voice in my head is like, oh, sure, well, you're a consultant. You can come in. You can say like, here are the questions you guys should be asking. See ya. You know, and then the community is just sort of like all, um, because there is, there is loss when, you know, you sort of, 
follow the Priya Parker way, which I know is not just, you know, the, the same dialogue and all, but like, there is loss, like, there is loss. And, and loss is so, to acknowledge to a community, there's going to be loss, even though, you know, that's just, that's, it's just really hard. It's really it's hard. Painful. And like, and we can do hard things. You know, I, I was recently um, advising a couple who was, um, their wedding was upended by coronavirus. I was actually advising them before even Corona. Yeah. And um, they were navigating and we were doing it for another podcast that also got upended by Corona. <laughs> and one of the things I said to them, they were debating basically who to invite. And the, the, the husband, in this case, the, the, the groom, was beginning to mourn the idea that he couldn't invite all of his, um, all of his, what are they called? Uh, fraternity brothers. <laughs> and he said, and we started to talk about it and he said, well, part of it is we've always gone together and it's not that I'm close, equally close to all of them, but every experience is actually at that unit, but it's a huge unit. And he had to figure out how to fit this, he was trying to fit this huge no unit into the size of a pea. Yeah. And I said to him, in every wedding, there's also a lot of little funerals. Oh, yeah. Right? Which is like yeah. the death of your single self. And, you, and yeah. we need to grieve that, right? The death of the, the part of me that will go do anything for my fraternity brothers. Well, not anymore. If yeah. that anything clashes with something that my union calls for, then I have to let that go, right? And so... So much of our life, I mean, it's not like these fancy rooms that are having these moments about transition. We are navigating transition in our families, in our friendships, in our neighborhoods, in our, in, in our everyday relationships. And part of, like, if you don't draw the line, you're, it's very difficult to be about anything. But if you don't grieve the line drawing, yeah. then you get stuck in it. And I think one of the challenges for weddings, especially, I'm trying to think if there are other life cycle events as much, maybe a bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. Like one of the things about a wedding is that the line drawing that the celebrants might do might look different than the line drawing, for instance, that the parents of the celebrants might do, yes. or even the other fraternity brothers of the celebrants. Yes. And those are the people that I'm counseling where, you know, because especially in the Jewish tradition, and I think in more American tradition, there, you know, for the celebrants, it's like, this day is about us. And so we are the ones who get to make the decisions. But certainly in the Jewish tradition, I know not just the Jews, others as well, it's not just about them. It's about the community and the people whose shoulders they stand on. And, and so, I mean, what do you do when you ha come upon those moments where you have primary, uh, you know, hosts or celebrants? You talked about this a little bit with you and your husband. Like, you know, when you have these primary, but like the values are just coming under, so they're clashing in such ways. Like, how do you, are, are there tri tricks or tools that you use? <laughs> Please, you, help you, me. What's you the cry a lot first. <laughs> I'm good at that. I, that one I got down. Um... I mean, at some level, you know, some of this is irreconcilable values, right? Yeah. Incontractable values. And I think you, you talked earlier about the, the two Hebrew words that mean engraved and also freedom, and they're very similar in the Christian tradition, which, you know, I am half from. A similar English word is the use of the word cleave, right? So the word cleave right. means both to cut, right? And it also means to bind. Yeah. Mm. Right. And cleave is a word that's often used in wedding ceremonies because you are both cutting yeah. and you are binding. Right. And again, when you're in the middle of it, like I don't want to be, all of my cleaving is deeply painful, right? I'm, my, the core of my work is figuring out my own pain through others, right? <laughs> Let's be clear here. Um, but, but, part of the part of the crashing yeah. in these weddings is designed yeah it's a designed crash I, I think about one of the traditions as part of the jewish wedding ceremony is is that the the mothers traditionally of the celebrants break a plate mm. and one of the many reasons for breaking the plate is this is the the visual for the mothers of like oh. this is the new i know i don't Beautiful. I don't say that out loud at the wedding because you don't need like, you know, but like the visual of like, there is something new being created here and that needs to be our primary value in this moment of the cer ceremony. Mm -hmm. Another moment of ceremony, it might be a different one, but. Uh, 
when my um, my husband and I got married, we, you know, I come from these two very different households. And up until the wedding, I never had to really say any sentence in front of all four parents ever, right? right. Like they were never in the same room, right? right? So I was a world-class chameleon. My husband jokes, if one family, if in one family, someone sneezes, I say, bless you. And in the other, I say, God bless you, right? Like <laughs> I know how to code switch, yeah. except then in my wedding, they're all going to be in the same room. Do we use the word God? Do we if we bring in the Bible, is the Bible allowed? If we bring it in, who owns it? If we, what gets us married? Is it the laying of the, of the flowers or is it the, you know, who gets us married, right? It's, it, it's like a complete, it's the modern nightmare at some level, which I think um, allowed us to end and, you know, it's my nightmare. Right. It, I mean, and it's also my it's my being like I don't have the, the the ability to not look at it. And so I figure out ways to look at it. And um, we borrowed uh, we designed our kind of own ritual. Um, I know. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and one of the elements that we borrowed was from a Jewish tradition. You'll have to tell me the, the word for it. But a friend of ours, Jewish friends of ours, told us of a tradition that of wisdom which is after, at least in their families, after, right after you get married, you don't, they, you don't go and greet your community or go and take photos. You go and have seven minutes together yeah. uh, alone. Yeah. And, and we did that. And, mm -hmm. and it was really beautiful because it was this like very powerful, in gathering, power is also time, right? Real estate, you have seven hours. It takes yeah. seven minutes right after you get married and go be alone. It's a yeah. pretty radical act. And, you know, this is an Indian wedding. And so, yeah. like, we're alone and my cousin bursts into the door and goes and looking for almonds. And my, you know, <laughs> some other you know, <laughs> grandmother comes in and, like, flailing around. <laughs> oh, you didn't mean me. You didn't mean I couldn't be in here. I thought you yeah. were else could be in here. I just need the almonds. I just need the almonds. I'll be right out. Um, but, but I think in each of the, it goes back to our earlier conversation, which is, Rituals are powerful when they hit a specific need yeah. and also when they are an embodied practice to get the to, to stop intellectualizing an idea and begin to experience it. And so whether it's the plate crashing, you know, in an Indian and I think in other contexts also there's a there's a history and it's, you know, within patriarchy because traditionally the woman left her mother's home never to return and to to go into her husband's home and there's a tradition of painting, you know, putting your hand in turmeric or in haldi or in you know or in or in a red powder and leaving your hand mark on your mother's home never to return again Oof, right yeah. and as those structures of patriarchy are crumbling yeah oh god there really, is still god deep really. power i mean yeah at least in some <laughs> families like there is still power in that act of putting your hand mark on your parents home but what if both children did that? What if yeah. the bride and the groom did that? Because they are leaving their parents' home. What? That's so beautiful. And oh my God, one day I'd love to have like another conversation with you about the ways that we revalue ancient traditions, even the ones that come from homophobia and misogyny. And we cannot mm -hmm. pretend that they don't come from those places. Mm -hmm. We have to acknowledge the pain because certainly there's been a lot, but how can we, you know, another example in the Jewish tradition is the mikvah. Have you heard of that? This is like the ritual bath that traditional women go in after their period, their menstrual cycle, and it doesn't come from the most feminist of reasons, but like reclaim, I mean, talk about a period party, right? Like that is like, that was like a, that was a theme throughout your book, which was so sweet. And I was so sad that both my girls are already teenagers and I want to, <laughs> um, hopefully they're not listening, but, um, but this idea of like honoring the period and sort of revaluing things is a whole new way to sort of bring the ancient into the modern, what is the need now? I mean, I have learned, I have learned so much from, uh, and I continue to learn so much from Jewish teachers. And one of the, um, one of the, the sources that, that have really helped me in the last four or five years as I've navigated con complicated relationships with my parents is, and, and you'll have to tell me where this comes from, but is the, I don't know if it's a, a rabbi who wrote this, but it's the Jewish concept of forgiveness and the four steps of, a, of an mm. actual apology. Yeah, Maimonides. Yeah. And, Probably, and, yeah. and one of them that it, to me is so powerful is um, like restitution or correction or actually like structurally solving 
like yeah. working against the system that created that act. Yeah. yeah. And I think what, like borrowing from that in this ritual conversation, I think so much of whether, whether an act like the mikvah comes from a, from a misogynist pers- or, you know, patriarchal or, or homophobic, I, I think that if we are going to borrow rituals from previous contexts with structures that were unfair, the writing of the ritual needs to inherently have a correction in it. Right. Right. right Otherwise right. it's appropriation. But, right. but if it has a correction in it, right. Mm-hmm. And I don't know the form of the correction, if it's spoken language, if it's, if there's conditions, if there's, but, but, but I, I believe that you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, yeah. but we need to actually consciously think about what are the rituals, what are the needs we now have, what right. are the ancient forms of wisdom, and is there a way to extract the wisdom while correcting and fighting for equality? Yeah, I wanted, what you made me think of is um, I did, uh, I officiated at a baby naming a, a thousand years ago, but it was like March, but you know, <laughs> and the mom asked me as, as I was beginning as part of my opening to just um, remind everyone that we were standing on tribal ground, right? We were standing on, on ground that was taken from other people. And I thought it was, it was such a powerful way to begin. Like we began with it, we paused, we acknowledged that, you know, we might be standing on the corner of 6th and I Street in Washington, DC, but we're not the first ones here. And in fact, um, terrible things have happened in order for us to end up here. And so the idea of like sort of Rem- being reminded that even as we are doing new and beautiful and standing in our, you know, however many story building and, you know, th- there was pain that was required in that. And to set that as part of, 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 of the need of the education to remind people, I think could be, um, you know, could change the trajectory. And I think it's really interesting that your, in your case, your name, Six and I, is related to a physical place that from a community perspective, it's important to have an identity around, right? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, to begin to insert new stories, right, mm-hmm. about the palimpsest that happened before you created this story, is that a threat? Maybe. Is yeah, that yeah. a threat to begin to weave and begin to shift the narrative? How, ba- how far back does Six and I go what do we start to change the idea of who we're for because of how long back we think about what six and i was do we start to put new photographs if there was a lynching at six and i do we put that photo up right and 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 can you to go to our earlier conversation can we go wide enough across time and history and maybe it's like the pace can't be sudden but it's it's a slow unlayering that yeah. six and I changes its meaning over time, but yeah. actually it's a fulfillment of six and I. Yeah. I think it's so beautiful, especially because we do also, I mean, and, and the sort of the, the, I was thinking about, we also have a history as a displaced people, right? And so it's sort of like, what does it mean to sort of interweave our story uh, and the ways that it's been used, you know, with other stories? Um, I want to, so this idea that it can be a threat, I think is really important to surface as part of our conversation because, you know, in in order to do the work that you're talking about doing, one of the things you talk about a lot, and also like, you know, I always say like, I'm a chassid, I'm a student of Brene Brown's, right? This is the work of vulnerability. And I love, I'm I'm leading services next Friday night and um, we're going to do a takeoff of 15 toasts, like a sort of like, and I said to the woman who's leading, I said, can you go first? Because I've been reading Priya Parker's book and, and the way you talk about modeling vulnerability, because I do think that there will be feelings of threat all over the place, especially in family systems that have always worked or gatherings, you know, communities that have always worked certain way. And all of a sudden you're like moving a little bit. So I guess here's, I have 10 questions, but I'm going to ask this one. Like, if you are talking to a community or a family that is really just starting to move into more thoughtful, what are the sort of first steps that people should do? Because I, I think there's like a Kennedy School, Ron Heifetz, that, that you know, the leadership is like change at a rate that people can tolerate or something like mm-hmm. that. I don't know. Yeah. So it's sort of like, how do you start moving people towards a more thoughtful way of gathering a more, when you have multiple people involved at the same time? Um, you start by asking what is the need what is the need that we are trying to address here 
through a gathering and who can uniquely help us fill that need, address that need. And if it takes you 16 months to answer what is the need here, take 16 months. But once you began to ask, like the gathering you were talking about in California um, of the clan, yeah. I mean, it, it couldn't have been so like easy that the second you said, what is a need? They were like, oh, we got it. Cause it no, was no, like, no. <laughs> so I think here, I mean, you know, that was, I don't know what they ended up doing, but if I were to be advising of a family of multiple generations in something like that, I would ask them first, again, it depends on the context, right? But if I was creating a session for them, whether I was there or not, I would first ask them to start with story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would start, I wouldn't ask them for their opinions. I wouldn't mm -hmm. ask them what they think about meat or veg vegetables. I wouldn't ask them what they think it means to be a Patel. I would ask them to tell the story, tell a story. And I would invite for, and this is the first, the second phase of sustained dialogue. The first is deciding to engage, but the second is called, you know, kind of clunkily downloading. But what is downloading? It's story sharing. Right. And so, so I would ask to say, what does it mean to you if you go continue with this meat or vegetarian? Like, when is a moment since you've been in America, and I would ask every generation this, where you felt that you belonged? Mm -hmm. When is a moment since you've been in America, and for some that might be birth, where you felt apart? Right. When is a moment, tell us a story about a moment in which you began to question your own identity. Yeah. Tell us a moment, right? It's like starting to flood the stories yeah. and stories help us complicate the individual yeah. without trying to make the group the same. Yeah, it's so beautiful because I am imagining, right? Like the leaders of this gathering, someone tells a story about being made fun of in, when they were growing up because they were in school and they were vegetarian and they were made fun of. So for them, like the food is such an integral part of identity. And then I also imagine someone telling a story and realizing, oh, there's not so much of a loss if we have a table with chicken in it. Like it's, it, we will actually survive, right? And, 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 so and to just build on that a point, if you hear all of a sudden that your great uncle, the fuddy-duddy that you think is so conservative, is, yeah. radical, is vegetarian as a radical act because yeah. he was bullied as a seven-year-old and he was the only vegetarian, yeah. and, you, and he hears your story that you're gonna eat meat and you sneak away to Burger King as a radical act, yep. All of a sudden, you have a shared value of rebellion. We spend so much time, and I'm sure you, you're an expert, you know this because of your work in a sustained out. We, we spend so much time in our heads making up stories about other people. And I, and I just feel like, I mean, every time I've done one of these like civil discourse things or community organizing things, I always have the first response. You know, my first response to share your story is like, oh again with my story this is exhausting i know this trope can we just skip it that's exactly right i know what you're trying to make me do right now and i'm not going to do it you still can't be in our group so but it, 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 it there's a reason it works like it you, works. you develop empathy and compassion for other people it works you know it works up until like there's like a breaking point where like you know the stories yeah. are just yeah. Or, or sometimes the stories absolutely fill the, the story in your head about that person, right? It's yeah. not, not every story necessarily complicates a person, but I would start with story and I would, um, depend, I, would, I would also, number two, I would think about whatever system you're in, whether it's in, an, in a company or an organization or a family, I would think about the real, the power you hold. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I would think about your perception of other people, of what other people, whether other people think you hold power or not. So in a lot of systems, the person who holds power perceives themselves to hold less power than everybody else perceives them to have, right? Oh, Meaning yeah, like, right, yeah. right? So if like a mother-in-law feels very powerless, yeah. and uh, you know, her daughter-in-law and her, you know, and, the, and all of the other people in the system say, no, 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 you have power. That's an interesting conversation, if nothing else. But also it starts to make people conscious to say, well, I didn't say I wouldn't go. But, every, but, but everybody just threw, decided not to do that because she was sitting like this. Yeah. Because there's, there's power in a system and we all hold different amounts of power. And then I think the third thing is to ask oneself before you enter a system is, what do I need here? 
yeah. right? I mean, some of this is like negotiation 101 and it's not my work. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's what is your BATNA? What is your better alternative to a negotiated agreement? When are you willing to leave? When are you willing to say, you know what, this way we're doing Thanksgiving this year doesn't work for me this year. I love you and we're going to stay at home this year, right? I mean, relationships is negotiating line drawing. And, um, and then I think the last thing is, make your gathering fun and meaningful and specific. And if you don't want to go to it, make it something you want to go to. Right. So I often say to like my clients, you're host a meeting that other, that the people you're inviting to would cancel other stuff to be there for. Yeah. I, I mean, just as I hear you talk, I am simultaneously just inspired, but also incredibly dispirited because I feel like human beings are so far away from like so much of what they would, maybe not all human beings, and maybe this is just America because I'm feeling sad for America right now and where we are, but like we're just so far from doing even one eighth of what like you feel like people need to do. Listening, listening, forget to each other's stories, just listening to each other, thinking about who holds power and who does it, right? Sort of having empathy and compassion for the other. Um, it's just like, I, I want I, I, to make it, I agree. And to make it very practical, like we're talking almost like at a philosophical level, just a couple of very simple examples, like a family that has, you know, most, I think, extended families are complicated. Maybe not all, but many are. <laughs> it's someone's birthday, right? Yeah. And right now, at least during Corona, it's say you're doing it over Zoom or, or, or you're doing it socially distanced, rather than just saying, uh, you know, come, We'll, blow, we'll sing a song yeah. and blow out the candle, bye. Um, to write an invitation that tells a story about the birthday person and what it is, and to ask everybody to bring a story or a, yeah. or a wish for them. Yeah. And, the, and, and you have somebody kind of over 40 minutes have everybody share a story about, you know, about that person. You're right. Um, you know, it's, it's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's it, it, this, all I'm saying is we spend more time focusing on the stuff of gatherings yeah. than on how to create meaningful connection and meaningful connection need not be complicated. Yeah, I think that's true. I think you're right. You, you don't have to start with like world peace, right? You can like start very, very small. Um, so we have two more minutes, but one of the questions I've been dying to ask, I keep thinking about the Seinfeld a quote from your book that the room is 80% of, so can uh -huh. you talk about a little bit of what you've learned about the room being Zoom and what are some like very, very quick, some like best practices on using Zoom as a room in this moment? <laughs> um, Okay, so I think first is think about the needs that, that, think about the role that a physical room often plays and try to figure out what you now need to do to create that experience in people. So for example, a couple of things. Think about how people enter and how you welcome them. Create a threshold. They no longer have to walk through the same door together. So how do you create the experience of walking through a same door together? It could be how you welcome people. It could be having people each in the beginning um, while people are waiting the first three or four minutes, if it's a 40 or 60 person or 100 person Zoom call, to, to find one other person in the chat that they either know or don't know and send them a little message, right? There's, there's a thousand little small ways, but we have to think about how to begin to create the interconnection. Number two, and this was on our most recent um, podcast episode, I found myself designing a live speed dating session like virtual speed dating <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, I heard and, that, yeah. um and one of the core insights that we that we played it on is we're so focused on blocking out the world behind us and like trying to pretend that there's nothing there and that might be appropriate for certain you know work meetings but in so much of the rest of life we actually each have an entire universe around us and play with that so that could be instructing people where, inviting people to sit in the place of their house or their home where they feel safest or where they pace or where they like to look out the window, right? Or where they're most likely to fall asleep, depending on the purpose of it. And think about inviting ways, you know, if you're teaching a cooking class, to not just have people all cook there, but to invite, you know, to invite people to go and say, this is what my pantry looks like. You know, I'm making this up, right? But we have right. this entire world behind us that is unique to this moment. What do you, what can you do about it? And I think the third is we need to become more sophisticated about the mute and unmute button. 
So I think there's all of these articles that are very helpful that says Zoom is actually really difficult for intimacy because of the way the algorithm delays, you know, delays our processing and our, our, and our mirroring of each other. I think one thing that makes that worse is collective use of the mute button. Right, if you tell a joke and everyone's on mute and, and no one laughs, right? Or, the, or even frankly, like the side, all, there's so much data in the side informal sighs, right? Or giggles or, and so once you start in a community, particularly if you're a team and you meet every week or, and it's a relative, if it's 12 or under, I say, once you have a constant way of actually meeting, turn the mute button off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ACLU, or no, sorry, not the ACLU, moveon.org a few years ago posted a, um, a gathering after the election on the Monday after the election and invited people to call in. I, I wasn't on it, but when you write a book called The Art of Gathering, you get sent a lot of <laughs> gatherings. And um, 60,000 people called in. Yeah. And wow. the person on the, the, the host, I was told, rather than saying, oh my gosh, ah, like mute, they, they did something remarkable. And at the beginning of their call, again, think about your opening, they said, there are 60,000 people on this call and I'm gonna do something perhaps crazy. I'm gonna take you off mute. And I'm gonna invite you to give one giant yop. <laughs> yeah. And the person who told me about it said to me, in that moment, hearing 59,999 other people screaming, they did in one minute what the purpose of the entire hour was, which was to remind me that I am not alone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. I feel like we can end on that. Um, this idea that we are not alone. I mean, I think one of the things, Revelation at Sinai, our rabbis teach was the idea of hundreds of thousands of people being able to sort of receive revelation in their own language to their own abilities. Mm. So they were together, but they were also able to feel like they were seen as they are. And I think like in this moment, like, may it be that we are able to feel seen ourselves to help other people feel seen and to know that there are many, many ways that we are not alone. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Priya. I am deeply, deeply grateful. Um, I hope this is not the last time that our paths cross. Um, and, um, good luck, I hope your family remains healthy and uh, maybe one day we'll get to see each other in person. Thank you so much, I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, take Be care. Well. Thank you.